Right, good evening and welcome to Upfront on the Joy News channel with me, Isaac Kofiaje. And tonight, uh, same old, you know, conversation, Ghana's debt exchange program. We've been talking about this. The first one was successful. Participation rate was about 85%. But tonight, another very interesting conversation. This is because two groups have been called to come back to the negotiation table for fresh stocks. I'm talking about labor and independent power producers. After this short break, I'll introduce my guests, then we'll have a conversation. Right, so welcome back. So this is still up front on the Join News channel with me, Isaac Ophiege. And for this simple conversation, I say simple because we've had it before, but it could still be very difficult and it could still look very, you know, um, complicated because we are looking at the second round of a domestic debt exchange program. We had the first one and it was touted as successful because we were able to get that participation a rate of 85%. Tonight, we are having another important conversation on this domestic debt exchange program because two separate groups have been called to come back to the negotiation table for fresh stocks. And to help me uh, for this conversation, I have with me uh, Dr. Richmond Etiahine, my very good friend. He's a banking consultant. He'll be joining us via Zoom. And then also I have with me Dr. Patrick Esumin. He's also an economist with the University of Ghana Business School. I also have Dr. Saad Idrisu. Uh, he's also an economist with Luciana Economic Development. Gentlemen, you're welcome to Upfront. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Right, so let's, let's start the conversation. I, I really want to start on this note. I will show this graph and we'll kick start. So Ghana started this whole domestic debt exchange program or conversation uh, where the finance minister announced that we're going to exchange old bonds for new ones. And in exchanging this old bond for new ones, it simply meant that, uh, you know, um, our creditors or those who came to buy our bonds were supposed to come uh, to governments and exchange their old bonds for new ones. And the target participation rate was 85%. Now, if you'll be looking at the data, uh, government's position was very simple. At the initial stage, government was looking to restructure about 137 billion Ghana cities. That was the initial target. And then we realized that government revised this target to um, somewhere 132 billion Ghana cities after some consultations and deliberations. There was another revision from the 132 to 130 billion Ghana cities. And we had the final one, uh, which was almost 100 uh, you know, a billion Ghana cities, 97.7 billion. And so if you look at the initial um, targets versus what government really restructured, and you do the math, uh, there's supposed to be some gap of about uh, 40 billion Ghana cities. Is this the reason why government is calling groups like you know organized labor and independent power producers to come back to the negotiation table for fresh stocks. Let me start with you, uh, you know, Dr. Richmond Etiahini. Do you think this is the reason why these groups have been asked to come back for fresh stocks? Thank you very much, Isaac. I think the problem was it started from day one in December on December fifth when he made a selective choices. Immediately you pick and choose, you're going to have problem with debt exchange. Mm. And at least if we had done what the Jamaicans did, they co-opted everybody into the into the into the into the basket, and they were able to do 99.2 percent of the whole debt. It's not about a certain percentage of that uh, debt as we have it. Yeah. So now we are in a position we are not we are in a position where we haven't achieved. The set target. So labor is being called upon to come in. The IPP, the power, independent power producer, are, are also requested to come in. And don't forget, Cocoa Board is also going to come in. Exactly. And Bank of Ghana itself, Bank of Ghana itself, would have to come in. 
So the the second phase is not just the IPPs and the and the uh, pension people. It is going to affect Cocoa Board and even Bank of Ghana. But, and the but, interesting but, but, but thing, if, I like, if, you, if you look at the situation, it looks as if it's just um, the IPPs and pension uh, the pension funds who have issue with this recall. Yeah, they have an issue with it because the way the thing the whole started, the whole the whole bu the business started. It looks like it wasn't done properly. There were no transparency. Mm. I mean, in that, in, if you read the G20 bit of the, you must be, people must be treated equally and there must be transparency in all that you have to do. Unfortunately, unfortunately, certain groups were taken out of it. So they re the other groups realized that if we have, a, 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 so if people have been taken out, why can't we? go and say we also will not participate mm. so i believe the whole thing started on a bad level playing field so it is now becoming increasingly difficult to tell people to come back that is why the labor is also saying the labor they have a little they have a serious argument because they think that if they allow themselves to go into such a thing they're going to have a lot of liquidity challenges and and what have you mm. so i understand the labor and i also understand the 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 independent power producers, they have sold powers to us already. <laughs> and you were supposed to have paid them. Yeah. And then suddenly you find yourself saying that, come to the table and let us do some restructuring of your debt. Are we, are we really, really serious about what, what would other independent future investors think about Ghana? That contract can be varied anytime we are we finding difficulties. Mm -hmm. And these are international contracts. And it must be religiously abide. So that is what I would say for the time being. Great, great. Let me bring in Dr. Said Idrisu. Uh, Doc, with uh, organized labor, the memo was very simple, that they were given complete exemption. Why do you think government is making this uh, sharp U-turn? Hello, Doc. If you can kindly unmute so we can hear you. Doc, kindly on mute. All right, uh, we are having we are having a, a serious challenge with uh, Doctor Idris Said's uh, line. Let me go back to uh, Doctor Rich Monetia. Doc, you were giving us an example from um, Jamaica, and if you look at the data, Jamaica actually did this somewhere 2010. Uh, was there any lesson that Ghana could have learned from it? You've spoken about the fact that. It was very inclusive, but in our situation, uh, we had to um, exclude some people. In excluding some, some of these people, government gave reasons. And I remember that some of these debts were, were not supposed to be restructured. They were untouchable. But in, that, in the case of Jamaica, they went ahead to do a complete debt restructuring. The reason being was that there was a constructive engagement. What I mean by constructive engagement is that you engage the people you owe. But you don't assume a position that I am the, uh, I owe you, so this is what I want to do. Unfortunately, so, so, so in this case, we, we, we went on the tangent uh, of a unilateral decision, right? Exactly. That is what I think that it didn't Hello. work very well for us. The participation wasn't good because it Hello. was not a unilateral decision all over. And I would have preferred that there would have been a serious, in Jamaica, there was a serious engagement for about six months. Hello. Talking Hello. to the labor talking to the banking sector, talking to the other uh, people. So they were able to get everybody. Dr. Saad, I'll come back to you. Uh, Dr. Um, you know, Richmond is, is making a point. I'll come back to you. Doc, please continue. All right, let me bring in Dr. Patrick, assuming he's an economist at the University of Ghana Business School. Uh, Doc, we're asking a very simple question, and... You know, organized labor, in fact, they right. were the first group to be given 100% exemption. So what I'm saying is that... Organized labor were the first to be given a 100% exemption. It looks as if government is making a sharp U-turn, uh, saying that they should come back to the negotiation table for fresh stocks. Why do you think government uh, is beating on this hasty retreat? Um, so good evening and good evening to my co-panelists. Thanks for having me. So you get the sense that you know maybe the discussion with the foreign debtors are probably 
not proceeding as uh, we want, as the government would have anticipated. So maybe the, 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 this might be one reason. But we also have to understand that when the original exchange was announced, there were several modifications mm. to try and then make the terms much favorable. But you have to understand that every time you modify the terms in that way, then it means that the government is giving up more in terms of how much is being restructured. Yeah, creating so huge deficits, at, right. Yeah, so if you look at where we started from and where we ended, we had, the government had to give up a lot more. So when you put those things together, you get a sense that maybe the, the amount of debt reduction that the government initially thought, they didn't get it. And then secondly, this is purely speculative, but you get the sense that maybe the discussion with the, the, foreign, the foreign creditors are probably not going as well as government would have hoped. So it has become necessary to now go back and do a little bit more domestic Great. restructuring. Great. Let me bring in Dr. Saad Idris. Adriso, he is an economist with uh, Luciana Economic Development. Doc, uh, welcome to our front on the Joint News Channel. You are live. You are coming to us live from the U.S. Thank you, thank you, Isaac, and uh, good evening to all my uh, fellow panelists as well as your listeners. Right. Actually, yeah. listening or uh, uh, looking at what is happening within the media space, uh, you are putting between as to whether to believe what the finance minister himself is Absolutely. saying or yeah. to just believe on uh, what the rumor is saying about the second debt uh, restructuring. Because if you go back to April 17th, somewhere April 11th to, to 17th, the finance minister himself had a virtual engagement with external creditors where he categorically stated that there would no be any second domestic debt restructure. He even said that that rumors going around was a misunderstanding and that he emphatically stated that there is not going to be any second debt restructuring. And he even made references to the MOU agreement that he signed with labor, uh, organized labor associations on December 2022. He made references to that. That was last year, mm. in December, and said that there is no way that he will come back and break those agreements. So if you're going by the finance minister wears and with a government that expects citizens to trust it and have belief in it, we should not even be discussing of any second debt restructure because our finance minister is assuring us that it will not happen. But then again, are we really sure we could trust the finance minister to go by his words? Because we have seen where they said they weren't even going to the IMF and finally they went to the IMF. Right. So I so, take the labor mm. organizations themselves should do the Ghanaian public some good and boldly come out and speak on this particular issue. Because looking at what is being reported internationally, looking at what people are, or, or, or experts or what some of us know, there is not going to be any second domestic debt restructure. If they take them to a meeting to squeeze their hands, they should come out boldly and speak to the Ghanaian public. Mm. Let Ghanaians know that, okay, with the memorandum of understanding that we signed with the government, the government has come back to breach that agreement. And in that case, they could even have a legal action against the government. Right. So, 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 so Doc, let, let's, need, let's, yeah. let's go into that memorandum of understanding that you're talking about. And I'm reading this. This is from the original memo that was actually given to, you know, creditors. And it says that Treasury bills, I'm reading verbatim, Treasury bills uh, issued by the Republic and certain non-marketable securities issued by the Republic are not subject to this particular invitation. So it simply means that we are talking about this domestic debt restructuring. But such Treasury bills and non-marketable securities may, however, be the subject of other exchanges and purchases by the you know, government of Ghana from time to time. Now, this is the final you know, MOU that government signed with the creditors. Now, in that same MOU, it says that you know, certain non-marketable securities issued by the Republic are not subject to the invitation to exchange. Such market, non-marketable securities may, however, be in the subject of other exchanges and purchases by the, you know, the government of Ghana and for, from time to time. So if you look at it, 
in this particular debt exchange program that we're talking about, they are not included. But there's probably going to be a future, you know, um, call for exchange. And this is in the memorandum that, Doc, you are talking about. And that is why I'm saying that it makes it hard for citizens as well as the general public to have confidence and trust in the government mm. when you keep going back on your own ways. Because if you look at part of the memo too, the government was very specific, especially with the December 22nd memo, mm. with regards to pension funds, government totally exempted pension funds. So when you come back now to include the labor organizations, and you bring in such discussions to them, meaning that you are breaching your own agreement that you have with them. And definitely there could be a legal action, looking at it from the legal point of view. But let's just say that even the government goes back again to betray them and comes back to do domestic or second domestic debt restructuring. The question that every Ghanaian, including the government, should be asking is service. What has been the impact of the first one that we did mm. on our economy? Yeah. It's very important for us to get that. So within the first domestic debt restructuring that you did, you have created a mess for the banking sector. For the first time, the banking sector has been in losses. They reported losses, including GCB Bank. They reported losses. As we speak, government needs about $1.5 billion dollars to be able to set up the, uh, the Ghana Financial Stability Fund. Fund. Mm. We haven't even gotten that done yet. So all the mess that were created through the first DDEP is not even settled yet. And you are coming back again with another DDEP. So are you just looking to collapse your entire economy just so that you'll be able to go out and borrow? I think as economists or policymakers at the Ministry of Finance, they really need to come and look at this. They really need to sit back and look at that. Because the whole aim is not just to be able to, I mean, get credit ratings and be able to borrow more. You have to mm. think of the impact on the domestic economy. Because whatever borrowing you are coming to do, if you are just borrowing to build infrastructure without looking at how it's going to have an impact on the businesses, then there is not even a need for you to borrow. So that is where I think that the government should focus on and not even bring in the discussion of a second DDEP. Right. Because the first one hasn't even helped the economy that much. Right. Let me bring in uh, Dr. Rich Monetia. And Doc, I want to ask a very simple question. I'm looking at the agreement that organized labor actually signed with the finance ministry for that <laughs> exemption. Now, point I says government has decided to grant exemption to all pension funds uh, in the DDEP program. Now, we'll, the second point is GOG, which is the bank, the government of Ghana, and organized labor or associations shall, however, work together to explore mutual benefit options within debt sustainability limits and to also promote macroeconomic stability and, you know, in the economy and recovery in the spirit of social partnership. Social partnership. Is it the case that this exemption we are talking about was contingent on a certain factor and organized labor couldn't meet this. I think it wasn't a contingent. It was something like, like Dr. Andrew uh, is saying. Mm. If you're talking to people, you've got to be very explicit. You know, what we don't use, don't choose English, semantics. Mm. Mm. Why couldn't they have been very straightforward to tell them that in view of this, we will do this or we will do that. Once you tell somebody that you're not going to do it and you do it, then you cannot be trusted. So, cannot so, be so trusted. in your case, this so for two, me, these I two am points are not explicit, isn't it? No, I'm torn between <laughs> the statements that you want to do this and you want to, don't want to do this. Why did we put ourselves in such a position when you knew that you were not going to achieve your target? And then after you have done something, and you think you didn't achieve your, your target, then you want to roll on roll in the second time. So that is where I have a big, big, big challenge. And the unions, the labor people, the other time told us specifically on the radio mm. that is not going to happen. <laughs> and they keep on saying it. Recently, the TUC man, uh, Dr. Yaba, have said it and I've read it. And so it is an issue that needs to be talked through very well. 
because it can bring us a doctor assuming was saying it could be a factor for us not even achieving the external external uh risk uh, restructuring mm. because they will see that it was partially done not fully done so they will possibly assume like dr Zimi said they are telling us to do the right thing for us to be able to go to external so me that is where i sit and i think that is the challenge we are now right. facing right. in this economy right dr dr patrick Esume, do you think there's any external you know factor actually influencing this because if you look at the euro bond markets for instance we owe them about 13 billion dollars and most of these funds are pension funds so is it the case that if you want to come to the euro bond markets to restructure or give us haircuts then you should start from your own backyard well i mean we have to understand that domestic i mean in when it comes to debt restructuring the the, the type of domestic debt restructuring you've done is it's almost on head of right mm. Mm. i mean mm. Mm. It's, it's it's such a huge commitment it's such a huge loss that has been imposed on Ghanaians in this particular frame of debt restructuring so i don't think it's you know it, there's nothing to suggest that Ghanaians haven't contributed enough we've contributed massively but i think like my colleagues have said we have to you know, it seems like the government you know I, i'm not i'm not quite sure i mean what what is going on there's been a lot of you know you tens and uh, he's you know i will do i will not do to the extent that you know these days it's very difficult to see exactly where where we are headed but you know i think the the, the other question that you you had asked about you know uh, you you asked my previous question i think when we you know, we really have to be careful that, you know, we don't end up with an economy that we can repair because of the damage that these debt exchanges are doing. And clearly, you know, in economic policy, the communication is absolutely important. The consistency mm -hmm. of the communication is absolutely important. You can't be sending missed signals. Today you are going, the next day you are not going. Today, the, the other thing is this. You see, the government, to understand that the IMF program that we are going to implement, you really need Ghanaians being on board and trusting you when you say we are doing this and following up on that. Otherwise, you're going to struggle. So you really don't want to put, you know, take the first wrong step by seeming to be dilly dallying or you know to say today you say this and you are not saying today you you know to be saying one thing in public. And appear to be doing another thing in private is just it's just not uh, it's not just not on. So in terms of your broader question, yes, the sacrifices we've made. If you look at where people have had to go to IMF programs, the amount of sacrifices Ghanaians have made for us to get this IMF program are massive. We can't understand that. So the other thing is that you know when the the debt is, when the private bondholders met with the government and the uh, especially uh, senior senior Jose and his group they came up with a lot of alternatives that the government can do that will bring a lot of savings this is something that the finance ministry signed on and the individual private bondholders also signed on so in, if you're talking about an atmosphere of burden sharing we want to see what actions have been done on those point, on those points there were about 16 or so points both on the revenue side and the expenditure side so we want to see if you have done the first round of domestic debt exchange, what have we done in terms of those aspects that will bring savings before we come and uh, say that, oh, let's do another round. So I, I think that's, that's, that's really where it is. Dr. Idrisu. Doc, I am also looking at another data here, very interesting. If you look at February 2022 or 2023 this year, and when we actually said bingo, domestic debt exchange is successful, we're having a debt, uh, total debt stock of about uh, 370 billion Ghana cities. Now, right after the debt restructuring, uh, we are looking at somewhere almost inching close to half uh, a trillion Ghana cities. Uh, does this simply mean that all we did was just a waste of time and we could not achieve uh, what we, we really, really wanted to do with the domestic debt exchange program? Because a lot of debt has been added probably just because of exchange rates 
and so many other factors. And therefore, we are actually calling uh, some of these respective groups to come back to the negotiation table. Well, even as we speak, more debts are still being added. So that is one thing that we must uh, be, be, be frank with Ghanaians. Even the IMF program itself is not going to get Ghana out of that distress because even if you go back to the IMF own report with the debt projections it has given from uh, 2023 all the way to 2027, we will still be in a debt distress position with debt to GDP around 80%. So it's like you try to clean up just to get out of debt, but at the end of the day, you are not actually getting out of debt. You are only crippling your local economy. And that is why I said, for now, I am of the view that I'm going by what the finance minister said on I mean, somewhere April, that there will not be any second domestic debt restructure. But if they change their position or the finance minister change his position, and wants to do another second one, I want him to focus on the first one that he did and actually sit back to reflect on that. And I will walk him through just so that it could bring back some memory and see if there's actually even the need for a second one. Because the first one like this, you, you ended up even imposing three new bills of taxes, right? So the taxes that you intend to get about $4 billion Ghana City's annual revenue, where is it going to come from? Your domestic economy. The people, including the labor unions, they are going to be part of Ghana's paying these taxes. So if you are taking from them and at the same time going to take up their pension funds, how, just realize the amount of hardships you are putting on the ordinary Ghanaian, including the labor associations. Again, electricity tariffs has gone up in just this June as was announced by P, uh, PURC. And again, electricity tariffs are projected to even go up. So imagine the, 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 the sort of difficulties that even the organized labor associations are going through being in Ghana alone. That one should have been enough not to even think of going back to take their pensions as part of another second domestic debt restructuring. And again, if you go back to, uh, what's the name? Currently, look at the statistics for inflation. 42.2% somewhere April, very high. Food imports are going up. Food input, I mean, inflation is going up. How do you expect all these associations to cope within the Ghanaian economy, let alone to come back to take their pension that they are saving for their future? Speaking the of, speaking, speaking really of the, speaking of the association, Doc, sorry to interject. Speaking of the association, I've just been told that uh, Abraham Kumsen, uh, one of the leaders for TUC, is on phone. And I want to ask him a very simple question. Uh, welcome to our front of the Joy News channel. Uh, thank you. Right. So, officially, have you been asked to come back to the negotiation table for restructuring? Not yet. Not yet. We have a committee which is uh, responsible for such meetings. So, as at now, we have not been formally or officially uh, invited to any, any meeting to discuss this thing. But do you sense that government will eventually call you to come for a haircut? Oh, we are expecting them to call for that one because they, they wanted such meeting uh, on the, I think, at the end, ending of uh, April. But mm. unfortunately, the technical you know, team had left for Bolgatanga for this meeting mm. uh, celebration. So they weren't around. So that meeting couldn't come on. So we're expecting that government will come back with a new date. So we are expecting a formal invitation. Well, and if government calls, what will be your position? I'm not a member of that committee. Mm. <laughs> so it's very difficult to make any commitment. But I don't know. This government is uh, they are confused. So Yes. Right. If, if I got you right, are you saying that the, the government is confused in terms of... Oh, yes, yes. That's what I'm expressed. But you yourself, you know. They are confused. Don't you know that they are confused? Well, the way they are handling this matter, I was listening to you, the first speaker, and I think it made very good points. Mm. So, I think that... <laughs> 
we, we should help them resolve that confusion. Then we can... We can help it to resolve the confusion. What, what are you actually doing? Because the finance minister has a strategy, but you are saying he's confused. They are not saying the truth. Today they will say this, and that time they say another time. This, this, this IMF, what didn't they say? They said, no, I, IMF, we are not going there today. We are not going. So me, I don't believe in dealing with liars, people who don't speak the truth. I, I hate it. They, they, should, they should be truthful. You see, that's a problem that I have, I have with this government. They are always lying. So how can you believe them? So, that is it. That's my problem. Right. So on what basis are you calling the government you know, a liar or not being a frank in terms of the arrangement? My brother, you are in this country. Don't pretend you don't know what this government is doing. I mean, this IMF, why, why did we get there? Who asked them to go to IMF? Who asked mm. them to go there? They assured us that the Deputy Finance Minister Kuma was saying they are not going there today, they are not going there tomorrow. The minister himself also confirmed it, that we are a sovereign country, we have the capacity, we are... So we're saying all these things. Why? Are we KG children? M no, matter. Mr. Kumse, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the first uh, agreement that you signed with government. Yes. The government was giving you complete exemption, but if you look at the second point, it looked as if you had to do certain things before getting this 100% uh, exemption. Was there anything like that? that that's why they, they, they are lying. Their lying strategy is, is what I, I was talking about. They, they, they would, we have signed this in 22nd December last year. Mm. We sealed it. So why? Why these meetings again? They're not truthful. That's my problem. If you are dealing with any liar, you must be very careful because that well, person well, can well, be very well, dangerous. Well, well the, those words are very strong, Colin. You, that's there. what I can see. Me, I can always tone down because these people, they are in to, to, to destroy, you know, our future. That's all that they have to. They don't care. They don't care about us. Right. So going into the, the meetings that you are actually expecting, you said you are not a member, but do you have a sense of what your position will be? No, we because have given two point, the to Because two point seven given... billion US dollars of debt is huge, and so going into this uh, meeting, I'm sure you should have um, a strategy. We have given the mandate to our representative, and I cannot speak about it. Mm. I mean, they, 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 they may not be happy with me if I start, you know, opening up on this. So you wait. We are expecting the government to write the letter. As soon as they fix the date, why? We'll, we'll meet them. Right. Thank you very much, uh, okay. Bram Kumsen, for joining us on Upfront on the Joy News Channel. Let me go back to uh, Dr. Rich Moditiani. Doc, you heard uh, Mr. Kumsen uh, saying that the government has not been frank in terms of the arrangement and that they are still expecting a government to call them to the negotiation table for a haircut. What's your take on this? I think, like I said earlier, transparency and openness and high disclosure is very, very, very important in debt restructuring. And I gave an example in Jamaica, 2010. They had a serious transparency in it. So they were able to get people. If you just heard what Mr. Kumsum said, it is not good for, it's not even good for a nation. It's not good for a nation. Let me repeat it. Because if people, people will tell you that you're not trustworthy, then you have a big challenge. And don't forget, even this, your program, is being monitored overseas by investors. And if these words are used for, in the true sense of it, it is not good for the going forward for the country. So I believe that the word that he, we said, let us be transparent in everything we do. Don't let us behave like a headmaster and a people, not a doctor. And these days, it's not even a doctor and a patient. Now, a patient has every right, maybe in other jurisdictions, not here. A patient will ask you all the questions he have to ask you, and you, doctor, want to tell him. It's not when I, you've taken money and you want to restructure it from 2027, maturing 2027 to mature 2038 in 15 years' time over a period devaluing the currency with devaluing the money itself not compensated by even index linking index linking with, with, the, with the reduced with reduced coupons with, yes 
in other jurisdiction they do what we call index linking mm. you index linked both the principal you could have reduced the, the coupon and the and the principal but you index link it because inflation is tr- so much high in Africa but nobody thinks about that money today is not the same so for me the what the what Mr Kumsin is saying he's saying what is what is expected to happen the truth and nothing but the truth so right. let us wait for them to meet them and let us see what will happen we won't preempt what they were going to do because we are not there right. but let them come and meet them so that they can have this discussion they should make it open for those of us who are listening to them like dr summit has said from louisiana we should all be kept informed it's, it's a nation it's, it's not somebody's private property mm. i'm very sorry about this country sorry we're treating ourselves as if we are some country some village be somewhere a country and we have been treated like nobody can say it you say it and you're in trouble those of us who have been writing those of us who have been writing about the potential crisis of the financial sector if i tell you my the comments and the things i hear you'll be very surprised but it all came to pass right when the IMF document came somebody called me and congratulated me ah all your mpv values the 16 percent 17 and 18 19 all that you use is there people commended me from even from this confirmation it's a confirmation of what i did but if i tell you the insult they will use so many and it's not nice it's not nice as if i see as if ghana was is the country for one person no we should make ourselves like let everybody be part of it so that we will have this argument and discussions going on Right, Dr. Patrick Esumin, you, um, Dr. Richmond, it's your hands, right. Uh, Dr. Saad Idris, are you still on? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 I right. think I could hear Right, you. so yes. Dr. Patrick Esu, um, um, Richmond, it's your made a very good point. He says, investors outside are monitoring and they are beginning to put in place a game plan. And I remember when, you know, the finance minister and the Bank of Ghana governor, Dr. Ernest Addison, when they went to Washington during the IMF World Bank spring meeting, they had a presentation and they were asked about independent power producers, the debt that they owe them, which at that point in time was close to around $1.4 billion. Now, they said they had presented a fresh document to the IPPs and they were hoping that they would come on board for a restructuring. Do you think that external creditors are convinced what is happening in the domestic space? Well, that's that, I think that's something that the government will need to actually clarify through its communications. And also, like I already said, I mean, I'm happy that you were able to connect the labor union who categorically stated that they haven't yet had any restructuring yet. Because if you go back to the April comment that I told you the finance minister made, this was a virtual engagement that the finance minister had with external creditors to discuss the macroeconomic updates on the economy. I think that was Thursday, April 11th. You you could cross-check it. And he categorically stated that there won't be any domestic debt restructuring, no second. He said it to external creditors. So if they go and tell external creditors that we are not having any second DDEP and then comes back to Ghana to call labor unions for a second DDEP, it, it, throws, uh, it throws debt on the government. And not just this government, successive governments, years to come, will suffer the, the, the sort of harm that is being perpetrated right now because citizens will no longer have confidence in the government citizens will no longer trust the government nor to even believe what the government say and i don't think that is how our democracy should get to so i will actually be hopeful that the finance minister will hold on to his ways and not have any second domestic debt restructuring again let me i mean prof was mentioning jamaica let me just show you something before the debt restructuring was done, some of us spoke against that. I personally provided alternatives in the case of debt swap and other stuff, because debt restructuring itself is not sustainable. Look at Jamaica, that is mostly being mentioned. Jamaica did it in 2010, right? But it didn't help them. They came back in 2013 
with another second, uh, I mean, another domestic debt restructure. So that means that the debt restructuring itself doesn't help the economy. You are only providing more hardship on your economy. You understand? So that is why some of us were making alternatives to government at that time to implement something like a debt swap. Do you know that the HIPIC initiative under His Excellency John Ajikun Kufo was a HIPIC initiative, which was a debt swap agreement? You understand? There are so many economic alternatives available, but sometimes if you have leaders that don't actually or are not open enough to take advice, or to, to be able to consult, then you have some of these challenges. So with the second domestic well, debt actually gave us our, a fiscal space of about six billion, you know, uh, dollars as at that time. Yes, right? hip -pick, hip -pick, as at that time. And that was a debt swap. That was a debt swap. Huge I, fiscal I brought space. it up. Yes, I brought it up during this period and I told the government to take something similar instead of a debt restructuring we should consider them swap. The government didn't listen. So that is why I said, at least I will expect that the finance minister should just sit back, do a, a self-reflection. At the end of the day, people still need to survive in this economy. Inflation is high, 42.2%. Look at the monetary policy rate, 29.5%. Mm. Do you know what it means? It means that businesses are going to be affected because there will be high cost of borrowing if they go back to the banks. Is that the sort of hardship we want to put on our businesses? So do you know the consequences of another second domestic debt restructuring, mm. how it is going to affect the monetary rate, how it's going to affect more businesses, including these other uh, uh, trade unions, associations, and all that? So in a nutshell, the government really needs to sit back right. and reflect on some of these things. Right. See, the IMF... 600 million has come in. Whatever that the government could do, even internally, not just continuously raising taxes, not just continuously sucking the, I don't want to say the blood from, from Ghanaians, but at least find different alternative that it could even raise some additional support if whatever funds they are getting will not be enough. Because if we could go in the, the, the trajectory the government is doing, it will get to a point no Ghanaian will have confidence in even future mm. government, not only this government. Because once you set a bad precedence, it affects all successive government that will come into being. Look at, for example, government bonds. Government bonds was, we, not even Ghana, the whole world, it is always the safest to invest until the finance minister came and destabilize the whole thing. So do you think in the future, commercial banks, including other citizens, will want to invest in government bonds? We were, we we were actually from. the first country in Africa to issue a 0% trans euro bond in 2021. Yeah, so when you do that, you, you, you make people lose confidence in the government. And that's what I said, it will, it will follow even successive government, even when you leave. So some of these things, I expect that our policymakers will really sit back and reflect on that. Right. Because remember, we are building a country. We are building a democracy, a growing democracy. The more you push the citizens, if there's a revolt in terms of anger, it will not be good even for future government. That right. is what let, some let of me, us are worried about. Let me bring in about. Uh, Dr. Rich Monitor. Doc, do you think that we've just postponed our crisis? We've actually not solved it. Do you think we've postponed it? Uh, I wouldn't say we postpone our crisis. You know, we should always ask ourselves, where did we start and where have we reached? And I like this saying that always remember your past before thinking of forward. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. when these things started, this debt accumulation, so many people talk about it that it won't end very well for us in a few a, a years to come. Unfortunately, as Ghanaians, our attitude let us let it let us let it happen let us let it happen unfortunately now as dr idrusi is saying industries are not going to survive even the financial sector which used to be the golden bed <laughs> which the golden bed that lay the golden egg are not going to survive like that especially the local institutions so as dr Amsami, let us take a brief let us reflect on what we have done 
and see and do proper assessment of what is going to happen to us or what is happening to us before we go into the second journey. Because if we move and go and bring this problem and add it to the existing problem, you don't know where we'll be possibly ending to find ourselves. So I would agree with uh, Dr. Sam and Edu saying that, let us sit down, let us discuss what we have done and even ask ourselves, what have we achieved? Because I was going to say it, Dr. Sam, uh, Edu said it, when the Jamaicans did it, it was a, a, a limelight, but within three years, they have to do a second debt restructuring. Is that the way, is that the trajectory we want, we are going? That is where I ask myself, is that the way we are going? Then it means that we will end up in the, the Argentina form of debt anytime, like Argentina, you get up and go to IMF, anytime, anytime. Because when you started, you started on a bad note and you ended on a wrong note. So I would say, like Doctor has said, let us sit down, let him sit down, reflect on what we have done and see the consequences and the implication and say would we do we want to add more to what we have mm. in our kitty right other than that like we are all saying a time will come <laughs> it will be very difficult is that if it even started it's going to be difficult yesterday i was speaking on a forum and people were complaining such that if people were to go on the ground and do the survey the research they will confirm what I'm saying. It is becoming increasingly <coughs> difficult, especially a pensioner who has bought a bond. A bond. He said he won't sign. His, his interest has not been paid. His debt, the medical bill every month is thousand. It has jumped from five hundred to thousand seven hundred a month. Wow. And this man asked me, "Do they want me to die?" This is the man asked me. I said, "Look, I am not God." say you're going to die but it tells you the hardship that we are inflicting on ourselves which if we not do not manage it carefully it will get worse so i would agree with the earlier speakers and say that let us sit down and reflect and begin to ask ourselves because when we we're going we have only achieved 28 percent if you look at it right 20 20 percent what is the what what are we going to do to the rest how are we going to do it Right. So I'm but, going to adopt the same methodology. Mm. So that is what where I will end my case. <laughs> well, Dr. Idrisu, um, in the domestic capital space, we have two options: either to borrow from the bonds market or to go to the T bill market. As we speak, I don't know if we have a functional bonds market, bond market that the government can go and get a liquidity and, and then use it to spend on other, you know, uh, projects and infrastructure. Right now, what we are doing is that we are borrowing heavily from the treasury bill markets with very high interest rates. Are we at risk? We are definitely at risk because the more we borrow in at higher interest, you are adding up to the national debt. You understand? So that's why I said the whole idea of even the debt restructuring to the IMF is just so that the government will be able to get good credit rating so they could go back to the international markets and borrow more. So at the end of the day, we are not solving our debt crisis situation. We are only interested or we are only having the luxury to just keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. And Isaac, I'm going to throw a challenge to you, especially you those in the media. I actually like the documentary you did with, with the national debt. Mm, and if you. even you or anyone interested could even take this up as a project, it will really save Ghanaians. Do you know that every debt that is passed is being brought to parliament? There has to be an agreement based on either majority or whatever voting, mm. right? Each debt that goes to parliament, there is a purpose for that loan before it has been approved. Can we get any journalists who take it up as a documentary piece? Mm. You can even go back to uh, uh, 20 uh, Atamir's era all the way to now. Each loan that has been passed, let's see the project that the government said it was going to use right. it for. Go to the ground. Let's see how, whether it has been used for. Believe me, you will be shocked. That is why I said we borrow to waste, not to develop Ghana. Mm. That is the, as the, the sad truth. Because at the end of the day, the, they, they use the parliamentary majority to pass on such loans, even if the minorities against it and that's why i said it is not only this government you can go back to, even to general rollins era all the way to now 
let's do a realistic assessment and come out and tell Ghanaians how our politicians have been misusing Ghanaians' resources. Go around, you see projects that loans were being collected for under Rollins era. They are still uncompleted. Mm. But yet yeah, new new loans will be taken to start new projects. Can you count the number of uncompleted projects currently under Ashanti region? Let's be realistic. The MPP government will definitely not be able to complete all of such projects. So in the case that there is a new government in 2025, do you think the government will want to complete those projects? They will start mm. all over with their own projects. So at the end of the day, we have a system of waste. In every government, we have a system of waste. You can go back to Jerry John Rawlings era all the way till now. And we okay. actually see that we are crippling our own economy with our policies of constantly borrowing, constantly borrowing. And even go back again, look at even the projects, even the completed projects, those that they have completed, ask yourself who were the contractors involved. It will shock you that the contractors were foreign contractors. So you are you go to borrow, you bring the money, foreigners come execute the project, take the money back. What are you doing to your economy? It doesn't benefit your economy with such a capital flight. And we pay them in dollars. And we pay them, we pay them in dollars, they take their money back. Yeah. So whatever that we whatever that we claim we have borrowed, that is the same thing they came in. So, so we strive back. to get the dollars from gold, cocoa. Um, oil or whatever and then but we end up you know paying it to people and then they just send we it end up paying it to people even look at our our oil industry how many Ghanaian indigenous companies are really mining our oil so at the end of the day all the dollars gets flown out of the country mm. right right that but is what i said that mm. at least if any journalist could even take this up you do Ghanaians a lot of good just good any other loan that have been passed to parliament where the purpose that it was stated was it really done mm. then we'll see the true reflection of ghana right thank you very much uh, dr saad idris so let me now go to the strong room of dr rich monitor and ask him a very simple question doc i was looking at the imf um, document and then i realized that uh, the portion where the imf was talking about the banking sector saying that external and domestic um, factors could cause another, um, you know, a crisis in the banking sector where it is encouraging government to either do acquisition or merging. Do you st still see, see this uh, as a one way that government is going to use to uh, solve the economic crisis or the banking? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think in the banking sector, the banking space, if we are talking about acquisition and mergers, or takeovers. The, if you look at the, the DDP as it is, and the way the foreign institutions are <laughs> recapitalizing, the alacrity and speed for which they are recapitalizing, mm. my serious worry is that if you open up the state space for them, they are the, our do domestic banks, the mm. eight banks, are potential <laughs> bits. At risk. For, for them because the question those of us if you ask those who have done research on banking you know until the debt crisis came in the you know we we have one of the profitable <laughs> banking sector in the whole of africa just ask you let me ask you simple analysis you can bring 100 billion and buy ghana government bond 19.3 percent a year and declare profit and, and repatriate the profit mm. in dollars and go. Do you, you see the problem? Well, but yeah. if we were to support the indigenous banks, like Dr. Asame Idrusu said, then we are building a strong domestic banking like what the Nigerians have done. Right. Have you seen have you seen any bank competing very well in Nigeria, foreign banks? I doubt. <laughs> they made it such a way that it will be very difficult for you to compete with your domestic banking. Mm. Why are we selling our birthright? So when you look at the, 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 the measures and acquisition and the takeover, my mind is just telling me that the only a way for the international groups to take over our industry. Mm. As 
as they have already taken over our mining industries. Dr. Sai, uh, uh, Drusu was saying that. If right. you go into the mining, there is no single Ghanaian company in it. So they mine, they bring the capital, they mine and take the money away. Absolutely. And then they give us a peanut right. and right. we are happy. Because right, right, right. if Doc. we are very good, Doc. if we are very I'll finish. If we are a very good oh, country, sure. these mining companies could have bailed us out, bail us out with 10 billion, 10 billion dollars for the next five years, and we would have resolved our issue. The mining companies are cash cows. Recently, we have moved from second to top. What do Ghanaians get out of it? If you see the BOP, the balance of payment analysis, mm. you possibly realize mm. why some of us are a bit worried. Right. Right. They come and they take the foreign exchange right. and take everything and go. So my right. take on banking is very simple. Let us right. try to okay. support the indigenous and let the indigenous bank work Thank for Thank you Ghana. very much, gentlemen, for joining us on Upfront tonight. We discuss, you know, Ghana's domestic debt exchange program. And we ask uh, if there's a possibility of a second round of DDEP. I was joined by Dr. Richmond Etuahine. There was also Dr. Saad Idrisu and Dr. Patrick Esumen. Join News Prime is up next.